The anime starts at Suriai Academy, where we meet the main character, Elisa Mikhailovna. Her father is Russian, so she has an unusual name and is often called Alia. As she walks through the academy's entrance, she catches everyone's attention. She stops when a boy with a grand attitude greets her, introducing himself as Ando, a second-year student and a bit of an idiot. Out of respect, Elisa returns the greeting. Ando mentions that his sister has talked about her often and he wanted to meet her, so he suggests having lunch together. Elisa immediately declines, surprising Ando. He then calls her cold and proposes exchanging phone numbers, but Elisa apologizes and refuses because she has no interest in him at all. Ando is shocked and frozen, and Elisa takes the opportunity to leave, reminding him that the necklace he is wearing is against the rules. After this, students start talking about what just happened, noting that Elisa easily rejected Ando, the most popular boy in school, which makes them think she has very high standards. Shortly after, Elisa arrives at her classroom, 1B, and greets the other main character, her classmate, Masachika Kyuz. He doesn't respond because he's asleep at his desk. Elisa kicks his chair to wake him up and asks if he stayed up late watching anime. When she sees that he did, she tells him he never learns because he doesn't sleep well, watches anime, and then sleeps in class, not understanding the point of it. Cuse explains that the anime ended at 1 a.m. and he talked about it with a friend for two hours. She thinks he's crazy for doing something like that, to which he explains that if expressing your love for something, no matter the time or place, defines madness, then he admits he's crazy. At that moment, Cuse starts yawning, causing Elisa to blush a little, but when he asks her what she said, she just responds that it was nothing and calls him pathetic, clearly to tease him. Cuse then realizes he forgot his chemistry book, so he moves his desk next to hers to share. As class progresses, Cues keeps yawning, prompting Elisa to poke him with her pencil, making him stifle a yelp. The teacher thinks Cues wants to answer the question and, not knowing the answer, Elisa shows him the wrong answer to embarrass him. Elisa doesn't hide her intentions, smiling as her teasing works. She then repeats what she said before, this time in Russian. Cues, who understands Russian, realizes she said how adorable you are. Annoyed, he snaps back, and Elisa says, look at you, you're as red as a baby, making him even more flustered. We then learn a bit about Kyuz's past, where as a child, he often played with a Russian girl who lived near his grandfather's house, which is how he learned to understand spoken Russian. He never thought it would lead to this absurd situation where a beautiful Russian girl teases him in a language he understands but pretends not to, fearing she would faint from embarrassment if she knew. After class, Elisa sees Kyuz taking out his phone and reminds him that cell phones are only allowed for emergencies or as references. He responds that it is an emergency because the free poll in his game ends in 10 minutes. She isn't pleased and asks how he can do that in front of a student council member like her. When he ignores her, she confiscates his phone and notices he won a character named Tsukuyami. Alisa knows this is a reference to the Japanese moon goddess but doesn't understand why her hair is gray instead of black. Kyuz thinks it's a nod to the moon and that the character is very cute. Despite her annoyance, Alisa returns his phone, and while Kyuz celebrates his win, she says in Russian, I also have gray hair, you unfaithful piece of work. He gets nervous but pretends not to understand and asks what she said. She tells him she called him a gaming addict, making him turn to her and say that's disrespectful since he doesn't spend money on games, which is an insult to the true addicts, the whales. After that, Hughes goes to the cafeteria with his friends, and a few minutes later, they see the girls from the student council arrive, including Yukizo, Elisa, and her older sister Maria Makuyo, whom they call Masha. Hughes's friends, Takishi and Hikaru, comment on how beautiful the sisters are, with Takishi showing more interest than usual. Hikaru thinks Masha has a boyfriend because she keeps rejecting suitors, saying she has a boyfriend. Hughes adds that even if she didn't have a boyfriend, Takishi wouldn't have a chance. Takishi complains and then talks about other options, mentioning Yuki and Elisa. He thinks Yuki is engaged because of her wealthy family, and Elisa only talks to Kyuz, which makes him jealous. At that moment, Yuki makes eye contact with Kyuz, smiles mischievously, and approaches their table to ask if she can sit with them. Kyuz agrees, and the others do too, with Takishi feeling a bit nervous. Elisa also sits with them, and as Yuki eats her ramen, she starts talking about the flavor with Kyuz. Seeing this, Elisa asks if they are friends, to which Yuki responds that they have known each other since they were kids, having attended the same school since kindergarten. Kyuz then asks if Yuki and Elisa are friends. Yuki says they are in the process of becoming friends and that she would like to be friends with Elisa. This embarrasses Elisa, who says she doesn't think she would be much fun as a friend, though Yuki's kindness starts to convince her otherwise. Suddenly, Takashi and Hikaru get up to leave, having finished their meal. Before leaving, Takashi whispers to Kyuz that this situation is too cheerful for him. Now, Kyuz is left with Yuki beside him and Elisa in front. Yuki moves her chair closer to his and asks if he's considered her offer to join the student council. He replies that he's told her a thousand times that he's not interested, but Yuki thinks he would fit in well with her and Elisa, especially since he has experience as a vice president. Seeing Elisa doesn't know about this, Yuki explains that when they were in middle school, she was the president and Kyuz the vice president, though Kyuz mentions he only did it because she asked and that each candidate needed a partner for the elections. Later, they leave, and Yuki says goodbye while Elisa tells Kyuz she's surprised they get along so well since she didn't think any girl would want to be his friend. This confuses Kyuz, and he corrects her by pointing out that she is already his friend. Elisa is a bit surprised but soon acknowledges it. She then remembers she has student council duties and leaves, looking very happy. We then see a flashback of Kyuz's past, where he played in the park with a Russian girl from his childhood. They communicated only in Russian. 
Hughes wasn't very fluent, but she helped him by correcting him when necessary, and they enjoyed watching the sunset together. As she said goodbye, she leaned in to kiss his cheek. At this point, Hughes wakes up to a new day, having dreamt about that vivid memory. He comments that he learned Russian like crazy because he wanted to talk to her, but he forgot her name. Arriving early to class, he starts cleaning since it's his turn, along with Elisa, to take care of the classroom maintenance. When she arrives, Hughes notices she's dirty, and she explains that a truck splashed her on the way. Partly her fault for walking too close to the road, but she has spare socks, so it's no big deal. They then talk about him being in the student council with Yuki in middle school. She asks if he doesn't want to join the student council again, and he says no. Elisa is about to propose something but changes her mind. Suddenly, she starts taking off her socks right there, causing Hughes to quickly look away. Elisa notices and smiles, crossing one leg over the other, and asks him to get a sock from her locker since she can't go now. She urges him to hurry, but when Hughes brings it, Elisa asks him to put it on for her, which alarms him. She explains it's a reward for bringing the sock, thinking it would be a good prize for someone like him. She says in Russian, it's a reward for me too, making Hughes wonder why her expressions of affection in Russian surprise him so much. He thinks maybe her obsession with being perfect is exhausting her and she's using him as an outlet, exposing herself emotionally like an exhibitionist. Seeing him distracted, she asks what's wrong, and he says he wanted to know what she said. Elisa explains she called him a coward, then tries to put the sock on herself, but Q stops her and takes the initiative. He grabs her foot, causing her to get very nervous and exclaim she's not ready. As Q tries to put on the sock, she squirms and makes strange noises. When he finishes, his hand accidentally touches her thigh, and out of embarrassment, she kicks him hard. Later, Hughes begs for her forgiveness, which she accepts, apologizing for kicking him. When he says he's fine, she checks on him to be sure. Nervously, he steps back, saying he should thank her for showing him something precious. Realizing he might have seen something under her skirt when she kicked him, she understands he saw her underwear. Unable to take it back, Hughes bows and thanks her for showing him something wonderful, which makes Elisa furious. She hits him and starts insulting him in Russian, feeling really offended and embarrassed. After this, Elisa runs away, and Hughes chases her around the school for 10 minutes until they are both exhausted. He takes the opportunity to apologize, and she admits she's partly to blame. Hughes then kneels and offers her a can of drink as a peace offering. Elisa, being childish, thinks it's a poor act but loves Ashiroko, sweet red bean soup and accepts it. She smiles slightly and asks in Russian if he wants a sip. This question makes Hughes alert, thinking this might lead to an indirect kiss. Still pretending not to understand Russian, he asks what she said. Elisa replies that she mentioned there's nothing like something sweet after exercise, once again using the moment to tease him with her wicked smile. Missing the chance for an indirect kiss, Hughes feels frustrated. On a new school day, Hughes goes to the storage room to meet Yuki because she asked for his help organizing it. However, seeing that he's not very enthusiastic, she asks him to be more polite. This makes Hughes joke with her. Seconds later, Elisa approaches and mentions that they seem to get along well, surprising Hughes as he didn't know she was there. Then they start working together to organize the storage room, with Hughes handling the heavy items. After a few minutes, Yuki asks him to get something from the top shelf, which turns out to be board games and cards. She explains that they used these for school festivals and that she even played them during the new council meeting the other day, or she technically won. Since they are chatting so comfortably, Elisa asks them to talk less and work more, so they get back to their tasks. But then Elisa says in Russian that she also wants attention. Hearing this gives Kyuza a shiver, and Elisa continues speaking in Russian, telling him to come with her over and over. She even laughs a bit, not knowing that Kyuza understands her perfectly but chooses not to say anything, thinking she has no shame. Later, they leave the storage room, and both girls thank Kyuza for his help, saying it was very useful. Seconds later, Kenzaki, the student council president, arrives. He introduces himself to Kyuz, having heard that they finished so quickly thanks to his help, something Yuki keeps repeating. Kenzaki tells Kyuz that he has heard a lot about him and his talent, and Kyuz thanks him, recognizing that Kenzaki has an impressive aura, which is why he is the student council president. After that, Kyuz tries to leave, but Kenzaki asks him to wait, saying he would feel bad if Kyuz left empty-handed after helping with the storage room, and offers to invite him to dinner. Yuki also says that Kyuz won't have anything to eat at home, so he should accept. Hearing this, Kenzaki asks Yuki how she knows about Kyuza's home situation, and she replies that they've known each other since they were kids. Kenzaki then invites both girls, and with no other option, Kyuza ends up accepting the offer. When they arrive at the cafe, Kenzaki is amazed at how quickly the warehouse was cleaned up. He thought it would take all morning, but Yuki's help made it go smoothly. Kenzaki praises Yuki for being so efficient and good at handling both physical work and paperwork. He even asks Yuki if she would like to join the student council, but Yuki declines, saying she's not interested. Despite Kenzaki's persistence, Yuki refuses again, mentioning there are other candidates for the position, including Elisa. When Kyuz looks at her, he confirms this is true as Elisa will compete against Yuki later. Kenzaki leaves with Yuki, while Kyuz walks with Elisa. After a few minutes, Elisa asks if Kyuz will go home alone. When Kyuz gets home, Yuki is there waiting for him and asks if he walked Elisa home. Yuki explains she plans to spend the night with Kyuz, which makes him a bit unhappy because she pretends to be just his friend at school. Yuki insists they are childhood friends, which includes being close like siblings. She playfully wakes him up by jumping on his bed and telling him that her little sister came to wake him with love, so he should be happy. 
When her words don't work, she plans to jump into his bed and pull his leg next time. Yuki encourages Kyu's to get up because they have a nice day planned, including watching a romance movie together. She reveals she is quite a fan of romantic things. Kyu suggests they go shopping since that's the real reason they're out together. While looking at clothes, they spot something silver out of the corner of their eyes. Yuki, with her sixth sense for familiar faces, realizes it's Elisa spying on them. As they approach Elisa to greet her, she gets very nervous because she didn't expect to be discovered. She explains that she saw them a little while ago but didn't find the right moment to approach. Even though Yuki and Kyu's know she's been watching them since they entered the mall, they don't call her out. Elisa says she's there to shop for clothes, and Yuki invites her to lunch. Before they decide on a place, Kyu's interrupts to make sure they're not going to a certain restaurant. Yuki asks what's wrong with it, and Kyu's explains that if they go with Elisa, they should choose another place because the restaurant they had in mind serves very spicy ramen. Elisa assures them she can handle spicy food, so they all agree to go there. The restaurant, named Infernal Pot, looks intimidating, which shocks Elisa, but she reassures Kyu's that she's fine and just needed a moment to take it in. Once at the table, Elisa struggles with the menu as every dish has a strange name. Yuki explains that the pool of infernal blood is a red soup ramen and the least spicy option, while the pincushion is so spicy it feels like thousands of needles on your tongue, and the infinite hell is so spicy it numbs your mouth. Kyu's decides to order the pool of infernal blood, thinking it's best not to start too spicy. Elisa agrees, and Yuki, seeing they're both ordering the same thing, decides to do the same. As they talk, Elisa mentions that Yuki is dressed more masculinely today. Elisa is somewhat surprised, so Yuki explains that there are no classes today and she wanted to try something different. When Elisa looks sideways at Kyu's, Yuki adds that she was in bed with him this morning. This makes Kyu's spit out the water he was drinking. Yuki continues, saying that she wanted to wear something different today, so she borrowed the shirt she's wearing from him. This makes Elisa turn to Kyu's and ask what's going on. Nervously, Kyu's explains that Yuki showed up at his house, went into his room, and jumped into his bed. At that moment, their dishes arrive, and Elisa looks horrified at the food. Despite her fear, she takes a courageous first bite but quickly feels the intense spiciness. When Kyu's asks if she's okay, she pretends to handle it well, though it's clear she's struggling. Kyu's comments that the food is delicious, while Yuki muses that the chili peppers must be very hot. Elisa starts complaining in Russian, expressing her suffering. Kyu's clarifies that she doesn't have to keep eating, but she insists it's delicious despite her discomfort. As they continue eating, Elisa keeps complaining in Russian, even mentioning her mother as a cry for help. Before Kyu's can say anything, Yuki asks Elisa what she thinks of the food. Elisa says it's very good, and Yuki happily notes that Elisa likes spicy food too. Yuki then tells Elisa that the restaurant offers a teardrop sauce to make the ramen even spicier and asks if she wants to try it. Seeing Yuki's expression, Elisa realizes she's being pressured but agrees, thinking one drop won't hurt. Once she adds the liquid to her ramen and takes another bite, she screams loudly because she can't handle the extreme spiciness. Later, Kyu's accompanies Elisa to the park, explaining that Yuki had to leave to buy something. He notices that Elisa doesn't look well and buys her an ice cream to cheer her up. The ice cream lifts her spirits because it's really delicious. Kyu's then asks Elisa why she wants to be the student council president. She replies that she wants to do it because she doesn't need anyone else and will find someone to help with the vice presidency. She then mentions, in Russian, that she wishes it could be him. This makes Kyu's uneasy, remembering some unhappy moments related to the position. Elisa asks if Kyu's has plans later, and when he says no, she asks him to help her shop for clothes. Kyu's is initially unsure because he thinks it's an intimate thing for a boy to help a girl pick out clothes, but seeing Elisa's reaction and remembering she doesn't have friends to go shopping with, he changes his mind and agrees to help. In the store, Elisa asks Kyu's why he's being so nice to her, wondering if he thinks she isn't capable of becoming president. She becomes furious, thinking he underestimates her, and decides to show him who's in charge by making him watch her try on clothes. While changing, she asks him to move a little further away. Once she's ready, she hesitates before opening the curtain, worrying about his reaction. When she finally does, Kyu's tells her the outfit looks great and enhances her elegance and femininity. Elisa blushes deeply, closes the curtain, and wonders why his compliments affected her so much. Kyu's feels embarrassed too and collapses to the ground in shame. After recovering, Elisa asks if he's used to complimenting girls, which reminds him of Yuki's masculine outfit today. Trying on another style, she asks for his opinion, and he tells her she looks more attractive and mature. Elisa tries to hide her happiness from his praise, but she enjoys it and shows him more outfits, each receiving nice comments from Kyu's. She then tries on a daring outfit, thinking he'll like it. Leaning forward, she asks what he thinks about her sexy side. Realizing Yuki is nearby, Yuki comments that it's very daring, and Kyu's agrees with a red face. Elisa closes the curtain, wanting to disappear from embarrassment. Yuki asks what she said, and Elisa replies that she just wants to disappear. Later, on the train, Elisa stays lost in thought. When they arrive at the station, they say goodbye, and Elisa wonders what she was thinking with that short skirt. She also wonders why they got off at the same station, filling her head with various ideas. Now we see Elisa arriving home, where her sister Masha greets her with a hug. Masha notices Elisa is feeling down and asks if something happened. Despite Elisa saying no, Masha knows it's a lie since she can't deceive her sister. Due to Masha's persistence, Elisa explains again that nothing happened and that she just ran into Q's and her childhood friend, nothing more. This makes Masha realize that the issue is about Q's, as Elisa always gets flustered when it comes to him.
Alisa doesn't deny this, so Masha seizes the opportunity to ask if she likes cues. Alisa replies that she doesn't know what Masha is thinking, but they have no relationship and are just friends. Masha then asks how they became friends since Alisa supposedly hated slackers who didn't care about anything. Alisa agrees, though there are reasons behind it, which takes us back six years to Vladivostok, a city in Russia. Back then, Alisa's school teacher instructed them to form groups and create a report on local shops, with the best report winning a prize. In Alisa's group, they divided tasks to investigate different stores, and Alisa showed great interest in winning with this report. After putting in the effort visiting shops and writing the report, she asked her group members about their progress. One of them apologized for not starting yet but reassured her that they still had a week. This annoyed Alisa, but they continued discussing how easy the task would be, as a clothing store sells clothes and a bakery sells bread. At that moment, they read Alisa's detailed report and suggested she take it easier. Following this, they ended up arguing, and the group split. On the grading day, Alisa did not receive the best report. She realized she was wrong to expect anything from others, feeling that no one shared her determination, and concluded she had to do everything alone. Time passed, and the first day of classes arrived at her current institute, where students were surprised that she managed to pass the notoriously difficult transfer exam. At the start of class, Alisa notices that her new classmate, Cuse, is asleep at his desk. After waking him up, they formally introduce themselves. As the school day progresses, Alisa realizes that he is quite lazy and is surprised that even prestigious schools have students like him. Later, with 14 days left until the school festival, Alisa stays late making curtains. As her classmates leave, they mention that it's just a festival and not worth taking too seriously. Alisa overhears this and is reminded of her past experiences. Distracted, she pricks her finger with a needle. She reflects that she just wants to do her best and doesn't care if she ends up alone. Suddenly, the classroom door opens, and Cuse appears, saying he knew he'd find her there. He advises her to go home and assures her that they will all finish the preparations together tomorrow. Alisa tells him not to worry about her and that she will go home after finishing a few more tasks. Cuse then informs her that the craft club has agreed to help with the costumes and shows her a permit to stay overnight at the school. He believes that this will motivate even the least motivated students. He explains that he got the permit by asking the former student council president to pull some strings and convince the craft club that the boys would help if they saw it as an opportunity to impress the girls. He advises Alisa again to go home, reminding her that she doesn't have to do everything alone. These last words change Alisa's mood. She says she wants the festival to be a good attraction, not something half-hearted, and she refuses to compromise on quality. She admits this is partly due to her ego and understands that others don't care as much as she does, which is why she shoulders all the effort. Cuse tells her that she is focusing on the wrong thing, a school festival attraction can't be built by one person alone. The festival is for everyone to work together, and to make it the best attraction, they should focus on motivating the others. Seeing her reaction, he acknowledges that he knew she would be upset by this. He apologizes, appreciating her hard work. Alisa doesn't respond, gathers her things, and leaves. As she walks down the hallway, she wonders what's going on with him. As the days pass, Alisa notices that her classmates are gradually putting a lot of effort into organizing the festival. She becomes more integrated with them, and when the festival arrives, their haunted house attraction is a success. They even win the award for the best attraction, leaving Alisa surprised. Later, during the festival dance in the schoolyard, Alisa encounters Q's. He comments that the academy sometimes feels outdated, as he doesn't understand why they celebrate with a traditional dance. Alisa asks if she can sit next to him, and he agrees, though he asks if she's not going to dance, assuming everyone wants to dance with her. He suggests she might not know how to dance, but she retorts that she did ballet as a child, so this simple dance wouldn't be a problem. She had refused everyone because she didn't want to dance but had no trouble turning them down as she's used to it. Q's remarks that he wouldn't expect less from the ice queen. When Elisa doesn't understand, he explains that others have given her that nickname. She says she doesn't find it funny and asks him to stop joking. He apologizes, and Elisa explains that being called a princess bothers her as it makes her seem like a spoiled rich girl. Though she was born with more beauty and talent than most, she has never relied solely on that and is frustrated that people don't see her hard work. After hearing her out, Cuse agrees not to call her that. Elisa thanks him, admitting he was right and she wasn't. If she had tried to do everything alone, she wouldn't have experienced the festival this way. She feels bad for taking her frustration out on him earlier, but Cuse brushes it off. Still, she insists on making it up to him and asks if he wants anything, warning him he can't refuse. After thinking for a few seconds, Cuse asks if there's a Russian tradition of giving special nicknames. Elisa explains that her family calls her Alia, and Cuse insists on calling her that too, wanting to be the only one with that privilege. Moments later, classmates come to ask Elisa to dance repeatedly. When they become too insistent and her refusals don't work, Cuse apologizes to them, takes her hand, and leads her to the center of the yard. As they walk, Elisa feels her heart racing because of him. Cuse tells her he wants to see for himself if what she said about the dance being easy for her is true. Alisa happily agrees to show Cuse her dance skills. She shares this entire story with her sister, Masha, who finds it a beautiful love story, something Alisa disagrees with. Masha then mentions that she and someone named Sa were also close like that, showing a photo of him in a locket. When Masha talks too much about Sa, Alisa tells her to leave if she's just going to brag. Next, we see Cuse visiting the student council to cover for Yuki, where he meets Alisa's sister, Masha, who is the council secretary. Masha suddenly takes his hand, but upon seeing him up close, she freezes and asks his name. He responds that his name is Cuse Masachika, which means something like, with diplomacy. Masha ponders this name and, after a few long seconds, apologizes, explaining that she was just very happy to meet a friend of Elisa's. She then asks if they can leave, but she speaks in Russian, so Kyus pretends not to understand, asking what she said. Masha takes a moment to translate, explaining the meaning of her words. 
They go to a store because Cuse has to accompany her to help with some shopping. While choosing an air freshener for the office, Masha gets distracted by a plush toy that looks like Elisa. She then gets the idea to buy plush toys resembling the student council members. Cuse comments that while the girls might like them, the president would feel very uncomfortable. Nevertheless, Masha picks out a lion with glasses for the president, and Cuse admits it does resemble him. He still asks her not to buy the plush toys, and Masha reluctantly agrees, buying only the cute kitten plush for herself. Cuse accepts this but suggests that it should be charged separately since Elisa, as the treasurer, would get angry. Later, as they walk down the street, Cuse thinks that Masha is quite strange and wonders if she's always like this. Cuse thinks that Elisa must have many problems with her sister. They arrive at another shop where Masha hands him the plush toy while she shops inside. Cuse hugs the cat plush, and Masha comments that they look very cute together. She even tries to take a picture, but Cuse covers the camera with a bag, reminding her that they are here to buy tea. Inside the shop, Masha asks which tea he likes best, but Cuse admits he doesn't understand black tea. He thinks about how Yuki, who knows a lot about tea thanks to their mother, would handle this situation. This thought leads him to remember unpleasant things, like when his father told him that he and his mother were separating. Young Cuse accepted this decision, saying he preferred to stay with his father, but Yuki chose to stay with their mother. Lost in his thoughts, Masha asks if something is wrong. Cuse says nothing is wrong, but Masha places her hand on his cheek and tells him he looks very down. She then gives him a hug, whispering that he can relax and that everything is fine. This leaves Q speechless, feeling a familiar and soothing sensation. Just then, he snaps out of it and complains that the tea is burning him, as the cup is pressed against his back from the hug. In his clumsiness, he drops the teacup, and his cries of pain can be heard. Q's and Masha return to the student council where Tuya acknowledges that she bought the plush toy but does not allow her to keep it there. Tuya thanks Q's for helping with the shopping, as he couldn't imagine what would have happened if Masha had been left alone. He then asks Q's again if he would join the council, to which Q's again declines but agrees to help occasionally. Qs feels the council does not align with his goals, but Tuya questions why that matters, sharing that he became president to win the heart of a girl he liked and arguably less noble reason. This revelation surprises Qs, especially when Tuya shows an old photo of himself, revealing a less impressive past. Two years ago, his grades were terrible, he was awful at sports, and he disliked school, but he fell for one of the school's beauties, now his girlfriend and the vice president, SX Arshine. Tuya worked hard to become worthy of her and lead the student council. Tuya explains that a noble reason is not necessary to join the council. Even Masha joined at Chisaki's request. She confirms this, adding that it doesn't matter why you join, but what you do while you're there. Love or friendship can be enough if it helps students. Qs admits this is a good point, and Tuya reminds him that he and Yuki have improved things as vice presidents. Qs recalls a time supporting his sister as the council president, feeling inspired to help just because she was his sister. Qs tells Tuya he will consider joining, which Tuya respects, promising support whenever he's ready. Changing the topic, Qs asks about Elisa. Tuya explains she is mediating a dispute between the baseball and soccer teams. The baseball team needs the field for inter-school matches, while the soccer team has reached the regional preliminaries. So, they asked for permission to use the field, and now Elisa is mediating between the teams since neither wants to give in, and professional scouts are coming to see the baseball team. Usually, Chisaki handles these disputes, but she's busy with important kendo club matters, so she entrusted Lisa with this task to gain experience, though it seems she's struggling. After this, Qs leaves the room, deciding to check on the situation to ensure no fights break out. He finds Elisa between the two groups, who are exchanging unfriendly words. She asks them to calm down, as arguing won't solve anything. She suggests using the nearby park by the river, but this doesn't help, as neither team wants to play there. The situation worsens, and Elisa feels the pressure, realizing no one is listening to her. She doubts her ability to influence people and remembers her past experiences, where trusting others only led to regret. This caused her to prefer doing things alone, pushing people away and avoiding conversations. Now, she's paying the price for her isolation, feeling that no one will listen to someone who only criticizes. She starts to cry, realizing she chose this path but still struggles to accept it. She begins to ask for help, speaking in Russian. Just then, the door opens, and Qs enters, sent by the council. He introduces himself as Masachika Qs from the General Affairs Department. We then see what happened earlier, Qs heard the heated argument between the teams as he arrived, realizing this wouldn't end well for Lisa with both sides so agitated. He felt sorry for her but saw it as good experience and decided to leave her to handle it. However, he heard her cries for help in Russian, complaining about feeling alone because she spoke a language no one understood. Despite this, he decides to help her. So, Qs entered the storage room to resolve the issue. Recognized as the vice president of the high school, he mentions that the president briefed him about the situation, deciding who gets the field and who goes to the river. He proposes that the baseball team train by the river since they have fewer members, and in exchange, the soccer team will send people to help. This suggestion initially meets resistance, but Qs keeps his eyes on the soccer team girls. After a few moments, they propose helping the baseball team, causing the baseball players to relax and accept Qs's terms. The team captains agree, resolving the dispute. Qs then informs both teams that they need to present a formal request to the council tomorrow. Alisa, surprised by how Qs handled the situation, looks at him with admiration. When they are alone, Qs apologizes for stepping in and rushing things, as he put her on the spot. Alisa reassures him, asking why he made that proposal, since it seemed obvious the baseball team wouldn't agree initially. Qs explains that he knew the soccer team manager would offer help because she's dating the baseball team captain, which Alisa didn't know. He adds that everyone talked about them when their relationship became known. 
The captain's silence was because he wanted to help his girlfriend but also had his responsibilities as a captain. Knowing this, Hughes proposed the solution, confident that the manager would agree, benefiting both teams. Hughes tells Elisa that this arrangement allows the baseball team to get help from the soccer team, the soccer team to use the field, and the couple to have practice dates, solving multiple issues at once. Elisa laughs at this insight. They soon see the president waiting for them, asking if the problem was resolved. Hughes responds affirmatively, while Elisa clarifies it was thanks to him. Tuya congratulates Hughes for his good work, but Hughes questions if Tuya had planned this all along, as his reaction suggests he knew what would happen. This makes Tuya admit that Hughes figured it out. Tuya admits that Hughes was right about him having everything calculated. He then asks Hughes if he has made a decision, to which Hughes replies affirmatively, accepting the honor of being part of the student council. Tuya is pleased and asks Hughes to go to the office immediately. Though Elisa doesn't seem enthusiastic, she accompanies Hughes as night falls. As they walk towards the exit, Hughes complains about feeling trapped by Tuya, but resigns himself to fate. Tuya had asked him to fill out the form and submit it the next day since it was too late to do the paperwork now. Elisa asks if Hughes is joining the council to run in the elections with Yuki. Hughes asks what she would do if that were the case, wondering if she would abandon her ambition to be president. Elisa firmly responds that she is determined to become the council president and won't give up, even if it means competing against him. Hughes expected this, knowing her resolute nature. Suddenly, he tells her that he will support her in becoming the president, promising to always be by her side. He asks her to take his hand, a declaration that surprises Elisa. She wipes away her tears and, after a moment of hesitation, takes his hand. Hughes confirms that they are now a team, and Elisa thanks him, saying something in Russian that leaves him momentarily confused. He recalls a beautiful childhood memory with a girl he knew, feeling alive. However, he starts complaining about the pain as Elisa grips his hand too tightly. She angrily asks if he was thinking about another girl, noting his smile. Hughes realizes he's in trouble, having thought about a girl from his past, a major mistake in a romantic comedy confession. Elisa changes the subject, asking if he really meant that she could count on him. Hughes clarifies that he wasn't thinking of Yuki, which angers Elisa further. She demands he be quiet and accept his punishment, then gives him a good slap. Feeling relieved, she helps him up, and Hughes is happy they can finally head home. On the way, he confesses that it was the first time a girl had slapped him. Now feeling more experienced as a man, Hughes endures Elisa's teasing as usual. Shortly after, Elisa asks how his cheek is, and Hughes replies that it's just a bit itchy. Hearing this, Elisa moves closer and gives him a peck on the cheek. Seeing his shocked reaction, she asks why he's so stunned since it wasn't a big deal. Hughes remains in shock, unsure of what he felt. He asks if it shouldn't be cheek to cheek, to which she agrees. As she says goodbye and leaves, Hughes is left pondering what just happened, wishing she would explain it in Russian so he could understand. It wasn't just a friendly cheek to cheek kiss. He recalls that what she said to him in Russian at the park was I like you. He struggles to process this, denying that she could like him and convincing himself he was just caught up in the moment. Even hypothetically, if she were in love with him, he knows his priority is to lead the student council and meet expectations. Ignoring her feelings, he believes asking her out now would end badly, leaving him frustrated by his own emotions. At that moment, Masha arrives and remarks that Hughes is very charming, now understanding why her sister likes him. Elisa denies having any feelings for him, but Masha finds it adorable that she's hiding her true feelings. She advises Elisa to hurry and confess her feelings before someone else does. Elisa, confused, asks what she means, but Masha walks away without answering, leaving Elisa bewildered. Now we're with Hughes, who is reflecting on what happened with Elisa. He's questioning what he was thinking, feeling embarrassed about the events that unfolded. He also remembers that Elisa confessed she liked him, which might mean she was genuinely flirting and not just joking around. Hughes thinks her words came from the heart but quickly convinces himself that it can't be true, assuming that she was just caught up in the moment like he was. He imagines that she might have regained her senses and is now crying. This reminds him of a family argument where his mother accused his father of not coming home often because of work. Hughes feels uncomfortable and believes that love is fickle and unreliable, thinking it's foolish to worry about it. He doesn't think much of himself when it comes to supporting Elisa, especially since he left home and entrusted his surname to Yuki. When Kyu's arrives at his apartment, he's surprised to see Yuki's shoes because she had mentioned having other things to do. He wonders if today's events were orchestrated by Yuki to influence the student council, and then he walks in on her in the bathroom, barely covered by a towel. Yuki reacts with an exaggerated scream, calling him a pervert, but Kyu stays calm and accuses her of setting this up. She readily admits it but then asks if he's curious why she did it. She reveals that they've lived together for years but never had a moment where he accidentally saw her changing, something she believes every brother experiences at least once. Hughes dismisses her explanation, accusing her of acting like an anime character, which offends her. Yuki then acts dramatically, pointing to an imaginary camera and explaining that this was her way of compensating him for what happened earlier. She teases him about not being interested in her body, which she claims is a sign of his seriousness. Hughes, taking the conversation seriously, reveals that blatant exposure doesn't excite him and that subtlety is more appealing. This shocks Yuki, who hadn't considered this perspective. 
She continues to tease him, claiming he looked at her entire body, but he admits he only glanced up to her chest, prompting her to call him a chest monster. After she gets dressed, Yuki follows Kyu's to his room and asks if the student council president and Masha convinced him to join. He confirms this and adds that he's supporting Elisa for the presidency. After a brief silence, Yuki angrily accuses Elisa of stealing her brother's attention, even joking about the size of their breasts. Kyu's, clearly uncomfortable, asks her to stop with the graphic comments. Yuki insists that he should appreciate smaller breasts and even jokes about letting him touch hers, but then recalls that he did accidentally grab her chest once in elementary school during a game. Kyu's, embarrassed, brushes off her claim as a typical sibling situation. Yuki gets upset and asks for some affection, which he agrees to by gently brushing her hair. As they calm down, Yuki acknowledges the rivalry between them and apologizes for any discomfort, reassuring him that she knows he loves her dearly. They share a laugh, and Yuki leaves the room. Alone, she feels a mix of surprise and sadness, realizing that someone else has motivated her brother, though she's determined not to lose to this new rival. The next morning, Kyuz finds it odd that Yuki hasn't woken him up as usual, thinking the news from the previous day might have affected her. As he gets out of bed, Kyuz feels a hand grab his ankle, startling him. Yuki emerges from under the bed, showing she's not depressed or anything like that. However, after a few seconds of silence, she asks for his help to get unstuck. Instead of helping her, Kyuz playfully wraps her in his sheets while she complains about the smell, saying it stinks of man and that she's going to faint. In the classroom, Elisa focuses intently on Kyuz's arrival, puzzled by her own nervousness since he usually shows up half asleep. When Kyuz arrives and greets her, she is surprised to see him looking unexpectedly sharp. Upon closer inspection, she thinks he seems different, more striking than usual, though she tries to downplay it by assuming he'll nod off at any moment. But during class, she notices him staying focused, which confuses her and makes her wonder if he's truly changing his behavior because of her. Later, in the gym, Kyuz is suddenly hit on the head by a ball and steps outside for a break. Elisa follows him to check if he's okay. Despite him assuring her that it's nothing, she gets closer and compares their foreheads to check his temperature, making him nervous. At that moment, Kyuz can't help but notice her large bust, remembering the rumors about her cup size. Elisa then lets her hair down, making her beauty even more striking in his eyes, which makes him wonder if she's doing it on purpose. He looks away but can't resist glancing back, confirming his preference for subtle glimpses. A few minutes later, they go to get some water, and Kyuz is again struck by how attractive Elisa looks. In an attempt to cool off, he dunks his entire head into the water. Masha arrives and offers him a towel, but when he refuses, she wraps him up and starts drying him herself, giving him another unexpected view of a bust. This shocks Kyuz, as he's never seen anything like it before. As they talk, Elisa takes him to say goodbye to Masha, who, despite not being happy about it, remains kind. Walking together afterward, Kyuz expects Elisa to insult him as usual, but instead, she turns to him and asks if he's really okay, showing genuine concern about the earlier incident. Kyuz reassures her that he's fine and doesn't have a bump, but Elisa reaches out to confirm. He steps back, nervously clarifying that nothing is wrong. Confused by her kindness, he asks why she's being so nice. Elisa explains that she noticed he's been down all day and is simply worried about him. Suddenly, Kyuz's stomach growls, breaking the moment. He explains he skipped breakfast, leading Elisa to think that instead of paying attention in class, he was just too hungry to sleep. Annoyed, she reveals she had trouble sleeping after their shared experiences, while Kyuz seemingly slept without a care. Her angry glare intimidates Kyuz, who changes the subject, awkwardly quoting a proverb about turning the other cheek. Elisa snaps back, calling him an idiot and walking away in frustration, feeling her concern was wasted. Kyuz, amused, notes that she's still the same Elisa. After class, Kyuz asks if they can go to the student council office together. Elisa, still annoyed, silently leads the way, making it clear she's still upset. As they approach the office, they see a group of students apologizing at the door. Kyuz recognizes them as members of the football and baseball teams. When he tries to enter, a tough-looking girl intimidates him. She quickly apologizes, explaining she thought the athletes were causing trouble again. This girl is Chisaki Sarashina, the vice president, known for resolving disputes with a firm hand, sometimes literally, with her bamboo sword. Though Kyuz had heard rumors about her, he now sees her formidable nature firsthand. Kanaki, another student, reassures her that she only threatened violence to keep order, prompting Chisaki to complain about his phrasing. Despite her tough demeanor, Kyuz finds them adorable as a couple, though the impression is shattered when she roughly pats him on the shoulder. Masha arrives, and Chisaki apologizes to Kanaki for being harsh. He reassures her, saying he's tough enough to handle it. The two share a moment, which Kyuz finds bafflingly sweet, prompting a quiet comment from Elisa for him to keep his thoughts to himself. Kyuz jokingly suggests that if Chisaki wore a sash, they could call her boss sash, which makes Elisa laugh. Masha remarks on their good relationship, just as Yuki arrives, prompting Kanaki to start the student council meeting. 
With all members present, Cuse introduces himself as Masachika Cuse, responsible for general affairs, mentioning that Elisa and he plan to run in the upcoming elections. Cuse has just become an official member of the council, and Kanaki asks him to accompany Masha to work. He assumes Cuse will adapt quickly due to his prior experience but still wants him to work with others while he learns the ropes. Meanwhile, Yuki interrupts to inform them that she will be speaking with the art club about their exhibition and wants Isa, the treasurer, to join her for budget discussions. Isa agrees without hesitation, and they both leave the room. In the hallway, Elisa considers bringing up the topic herself, about Q's deciding to support her. She asks Yuki if they can talk, and Yuki agrees, inviting her to an empty room for privacy. Elisa tells Yuki that she will be running for president alongside Q's. Yuki responds that she already knew because Q's told her last night. Elisa explains that's all she wanted to say and that she won't apologize as she did nothing wrong. Yuki understands, realizing that Q's made this choice independently and she has no say in it. Although she regrets not being chosen, she refrains from expressing her frustration. Elisa tries to say something but stops, and Yuki, interpreting her feelings, assures her that she loves Q's more than anyone else in the world. This declaration shocks Elisa. Yuki clarifies that she loves Q's more than her own parents and asks Elisa what she feels for him. Elisa responds that Q's is a very good and important friend, but Yuki is not satisfied with this vague answer. She pressures Elisa to admit if she likes or loves Q's, closing the distance between them. Cornered, Elisa admits she can't say if she's in love but won't let Yuki have him because he's hers. Yuki smiles, satisfied with this confession, and leaves to meet the art club. Before leaving, she asks if she can call Elisa Alia and if Elisa can call her Yuki. Elisa agrees without much thought and, once alone, feels she might have done something reckless. Returning to Q's, he notices how skilled Masha is at her work, though he can't say the same for Chisaki due to her clumsiness. Kanaki skillfully sends Chisaki to the library to reorganize books and apologizes to Q's for what he just witnessed, explaining that Chisaki is always like that but is crucial for committee discussions and clubs. Q's understands, acknowledging that everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. Masha suggests they take a break and begins preparing tea, sharing that her family drank tea year-round in Russia. Knowing her mother is Japanese, Q's accepts the tea with jam, a Russian tradition. When asked if he knows much about Russia, Q's replies that he doesn't but used to watch Russian movies with his grandfather. Internally, he remembers studying hard to impress a childhood friend. After enjoying the tea, he recalls his mother's love for tea. Moments later, Yuki enters the room smiling, though Elisa doesn't share her enthusiasm. Elisa sits closely to Q's, explaining that in Russia, it's considered bad luck for a girl to sit in a corner. Q's notices Yuki and Elisa exchange looks, sensing tension. To ease the atmosphere, he asks Masha if what Elisa said is true. Masha confirms, adding that it's believed single people who sit in corners never marry. She then asks Elisa if she's found someone to marry. Elisa responds no and explains she didn't want to sit in the corner, later mentioning in Russian that she hasn't even considered marriage yet. Q's finds this normal for a 15-year-old but is curious about how she said it. As the meeting ends, Kanaki informs the second years to talk to the teachers while the first years can go home. Q's accompanies Elisa, thinking Yuki might have done something wrong. He asks Elisa if they can take a detour to discuss election matters over coffee. Elisa agrees without much enthusiasm, grumbling in her language that it's not a date, which disappoints Q's as he hoped it would be. At the cafe, he is surprised by the large amounts of sugar Elisa orders but keeps his comments to himself. She tells him she's tired and needs sugar to get her brain working. Q's accepts this explanation and changes the topic, eventually asking if something happened with Yuki. Elisa responds curtly, making Q's worry about what his sister might have done. Suddenly, she asks if he's dating Yuki. Q's bluntly says no and explains that Yuki isn't as nice and proper as she seems, she's just playing around to see his reaction. Shifting back to the election, Q's frankly tells Elisa that they can't beat Yuki at this moment. Normally, there are three pairs of candidates, and during their first year of middle school, their council had six pairs, twelve candidates, but half of them dropped out before the student congress elections. Elisa, not understanding, listens as Q's explains that the student congress is like a debate competition. If the football and baseball teams hadn't reached an agreement, they would have debated in the Congress to see who won. Elisa realizes this is what she saw in the auditorium and asks what happened to the ones who backed out. Q's explains that when the Congress presents candidates, it becomes a pre-election where they debate policies, creating a hierarchy in the eyes of many students. Traditionally, candidates face off until only a few pairs are left. Not all candidates join the student council, and this year's lack of candidates is unusual because no one thinks they can beat Yuki. As Q's talks, Elisa internally complains that they're in a cafe and he's not paying any attention to her. She starts eating her dessert rapidly, and when Q's asks if she's listening, she claims she was just distracted by the delicious food. Understanding, he doesn't realize she finds him too serious and boring. Suddenly, she gets an idea to make him more engaged. She asks if he wants to try her dessert. Despite his initial refusal, she insists, feeding him a spoonful. Though uncomfortable with the indirect kiss, Q's tries to hide his reaction and admits it's delicious. When they both relax, Elisa asks how they can beat Yuki. Q's explains that confronting her directly would be futile. They need to run a campaign with a different approach. Q's uses the example of President Kanaki, who won last year despite not being on the student council in middle school. The school newspaper initially made fun of Kanaki's candidacy, but over time, he improved his appearance and grades, creating a real-time success story that garnered widespread support, leading to his victory. 
Alisa understands that she needs a compelling backstory to gain the support of the students, showing them her dedication and hard work. As Qs explains this, he's also preoccupied with the spoons. He orders some food and asks the staff for another spoon. Alisa teases him, calling him innocent for being embarrassed over something so trivial and thinking he was more accustomed to female company. Qs is surprised and asks if indirect kisses are common in Russia. Alisa responds in Russian that she would only do that with him, leaving Qs trying to pretend he doesn't understand her. Continuing their conversation, Alisa asks how they can gain support like Kanaki. Qs advises that they need to show her willingness to work hard, starting with the closing ceremony speech, the first one given in front of the entire student body. He suggests she speak from the heart and not lie, as people are more receptive to genuine speeches. His compliments make Elisa blush, but she pretends it didn't affect her, asking him to keep praising her, again in Russian. Qs pretends not to understand. When Qs offers her some of his spicy food, he realizes too late that she can't handle spicy things. Elisa, not wanting to show weakness, accepts and ends up eating a very spicy chili, suffering silently. Qs internally apologizes, but Elisa calls him an idiot in Russian. As they leave the cafe, Elisa asks what Yuki will do since Qs won't be her partner, meaning she'll need someone else. Qs believes Yuki's popularity will ensure she finds someone easily, though it should be someone already on the council. He warns they could face problems if someone like Sayaka Taniyama appears. Seeing Elisa's confusion, he explains that Sayaka competed with Yuki in middle school and almost won. He finds it strange she hasn't entered the current election. The next day, everyone is at the council meeting when Yuki announces she wants to introduce someone. A girl named Ano Kamishima from Class 1C joins, taking charge of general affairs. Kyuz is shocked and looks suspiciously at both Yuki and Ano. When Kyuz walks through the hallways, he's startled by Ayano who suddenly appears out of nowhere. She apologizes for scaring him and asks for a moment alone. Kyuz thinks she's like a ninja, always surprising him. Once they find a private spot, Ayano reveals that she knows about his plan to run for office with Elisa and asks if it's true. When Kyuz confirms, she informs him that his father is displeased with this decision, especially because it means opposing Miss Yuki after leaving the show family name. This upsets Kyuz since his father had said that if he left, they would be strangers and Yuki could no longer be recognized as his sister. Now, it seems his father wants to act like they are still a family, which angers Kyuz. He asks Ayano if she was sent to confirm this, but she clarifies that she's asking on her own as Yuki's assistant, whose duty is to assess any threats. As Yuki's servant, Ayano never believed Kyuz would do something to upset Yuki and she questions if she was wrong to trust him. Qs explains that he didn't run to oppose his sister, but it's an unfortunate side effect. However, Ayano points out that the confrontation is inevitable. She then asks if running with Elisa is so important that he's willing to betray and hurt his sister. Qs admits it is because he promised to do whatever it takes to become president. Ayano wonders if it's because he has feelings for Elisa, but Qs denies this, saying it's just a decision he made. He also asks Ayano to tell his father that if he has any problems, he should say it to his face. Surprised, Ayano agrees to pass on the message. She then asks if his love for Yuki has changed, but Kyuz assures her that Yuki is still the most important person in the world to him, asking Ayano to continue supporting her. Later, in the classroom with his friends, Kyuz is asked about his preferences in a bikini magazine they are looking at. After discussing it, Kyuz notices Elisa suddenly standing beside him. Holding the magazine, she calls him trash in Russian, which hurts him deeply. After this awkward moment, Takishi asks Kyuz if he has thought about dating Masha, as the girl in the magazine he found attractive resembles her. Kyuz denies it, explaining that he only wants a girlfriend who can be his best friend. Alisa, listening from her seat, mentions that it could be someone like her, which affects Kyuz, though he pretends not to understand. He then remembers his childhood friend he hasn't seen in a long time and says he wants a girl with a nice smile. His friends agree, saying that people with cold gazes are distant. Meanwhile, Alisa, feeling described perfectly, is visibly affected, with a cold wind blowing around her. Qs tries to warn his friends not to continue talking about it, as it might hurt her feelings. Alisa, however, insists in Russian that it doesn't matter because she has friends. In the end, they try to make it up to her by saying something nice, but Takishi ruins it, leading Alisa to confiscate the magazine. Meanwhile, Ayano visits Yuki in an empty room, where Yuki asks if she's satisfied. Ayano confirms that she is, having confirmed that Qs is still the man she idolizes. She also informs Yuki that Qs is still running with Alisa and asked her to tell their father that if he has a problem, he should say it to his face. Surprised, Yuki realizes her brother is serious. Ayano confirms it, saying his aggression sent shockwaves through her, but she clarifies that she idolizes him just like Yuki does and doesn't feel anything romantic. Yuki calls her a masochist, but after seeing that Ayano doesn't understand, she explains by comparing her to a perfect servant who worked with the Marquis de Sade. Ayano thanks her for the explanation, declaring that she will continue to work to be the best masochist, radiating positivity. This leaves Yuki a bit shocked, as Ayano has just said something outrageous. Ayano then informs Yuki that Kyu said she is still the most important person in the world to him. Upon hearing this, Yuki rushes to the window to take a deep breath, calming herself as she almost declared her love for her brother out loud in school. 
She recognizes that her brother knows how to touch her heartstrings but also realizes he is determined to oppose her, something she finds interesting. She wonders how she can turn the situation around, enjoying the challenge of facing the prodigy her family produced. She then jokingly asks Ayano if she sounded like a final boss in a video game, revealing her nerdy side. At the student council, the girls are playing cards, and Yuki crushes Elisa in the game. Meanwhile, the other council members analyze the strengths and weaknesses of each girl. As Chisaki voices her thoughts aloud about Elisa and Masha, Ayano scares her by appearing suddenly. Kanaki notes that Ayano moves uniquely, and Kyuz explains that it's because her grandparents served Yuki's family. Ayano tells them that this doesn't apply to her parents, as they are just office workers, but she chose this path in second grade to serve Miss Yuki, avoiding mentioning Kyuz as she must keep their connection secret. However, she almost slips, prompting Kyuz to warn her not to let it happen again. In private, he sees that she idolizes him, something he doesn't understand, as he thought she was mad at him. Kanaki asks if moving silently is a necessary skill for an assistant, and Ayano confirms, saying her grandmother insisted on it. This triggers flashbacks of her tough training, something she is proud of. Meanwhile, Masha approaches the table, as Elisa didn't want her advice and asked to be left alone. The atmosphere between Yuki and Elisa becomes tense, but seeing Kanaki worried, Kyuz reassures him that Elisa is enjoying it. Masha also notices this, so they both laugh, able to understand Elisa, something Kanaki and Shisaki cannot. When the drinks run out, Masha goes to buy more and asks Kyuz to join her. As they leave, everyone gives their orders, and despite the amount to remember, Kyuz repeats everything without mistakes, impressing them. Once in the hallway, Masha thanks him for agreeing to run with Elisa, saying she's sure it made her happy. Kyuz asks if she intentionally hides Elisa's more responsible side, and after a pause, Masha explains that she doesn't want to compete with her. She admires how hard Elisa works and wants to support her. Kyuz then asks if that's why Masha acts carefree, but Masha says she just doesn't want to live a stressful life and believes everyone should relax a bit. She admits that she's more relaxed around Elisa, not wanting her to feel isolated. She thinks sibling relationships are complicated, as they are close but often forced to compete. Kyuz agrees, feeling inferior to Yuki because of how openly she shows her love and admiration. He thought Masha was playing a role, but now understands that she really is that way. He tells Masha she's a good older sister, which she proudly acknowledges, asking him not to tell Elisa. She also notices that Kyuz, like her, acts to hide his responsible side, surprising him. He admits that he does it for himself, to be left in peace, asking her not to pay much attention to it. Masha, however, ruffles his hair and encourages him with a big smile, making him very embarrassed. Kyuz is puzzled by how easily Masha can get through his defenses. Later, someone calls Elisa in the hallway, introducing themselves as Sayaka Taniyama from Class F and asking to speak privately. Once they find a suitable spot, Elisa remembers Sayaka was Yuki's rival in middle school elections. Sayaka bluntly asks if Elisa is really running with Kyuz. When Elisa confirms, Sayaka accuses her of being underhanded, questioning if she isn't ashamed for stealing the partner Yuki wanted to run with. This offends Elisa, who doesn't understand what she did wrong. Sayaka suggests Elisa use tricks to get Kyuz as a partner, assuming she did it to annoy Yuki. Elisa denies this, but before the argument escalates, Kyuz notices and rushes over to ask what's happening. Elisa says she has no idea, but Sayaka accuses her of doing something underhanded to separate him from Yuki. To clear up the misunderstanding, Kyuz tells Sayaka that he chose to run with Elisa on his own. Sayaka finds this hard to believe, not understanding why Kyuz would join this girl who appeared out of nowhere. Kyuz calmly tells her that Yuki accepted his decision and that everything else is her misunderstanding, asking her to apologize to Elisa if she said something inappropriate. Sayaka retorts that Kyuz is the villain here and, closing the distance between them, challenges him in the student council elections. This draws the attention of the surrounding students. Sayaka makes it clear she's serious, claiming that people like Kyuz don't deserve to be candidates. When Elisa tries to intervene, Sayaka tells her to stay out of it, calling her nothing more than a pretty ornament. Elisa defends herself, reminding Sayaka that Kyuz is running with her, so if she wants to defeat him, she'll have to face her too. Sayaka accepts the challenge, believing that neither of them deserves to be candidates. In the next scene, Kyuz and Elisa discuss the upcoming school congress debate with Kenzaki, where the main issue is teacher reviews for council access. Kyuz realizes that the scrutiny will likely target him due to his poor reputation among the teachers. Kenzaki questions if they should go through with it, doubting any potential benefits. Elisa counters, explaining that if they succeed, it will legitimize their candidacy. She also mentions that Kyuz insulted her, so she plans to force him to retract and apologize. Kyuz, seeing the positive side, notes that this will allow him to present his candidacy before the closing ceremony. He accepts their decision and plans to make an announcement by the end of the day. Yuki offers to help with the announcement and wishes Kyuz and Elisa good luck. Later, Kyuz and Elisa discuss their strategy. Kyuz shows Elisa where Sayaka, their opponent, will go, based on his knowledge of her. Elisa presents her countermeasure, which Kyuz approves but suggests could be more concise. Elisa then asks about Kyuz's relationship with Sayaka, and he explains that although they had mutual respect when they worked together, he doesn't know why she now believes he's running just to cause trouble. 
he admits that Sayaka might think he's trying to stir things up for fun. Alisa realizes that Kyuza's reference to another person is about herself and that she might be the cause of the tension. Despite this, she reassures Kyuza that she plans to help him win. The next day, as they prepare for the debate, Sayaka's debate partner, Nano Ayami, approaches Kyuza. She warns him that she won't participate in the debate, which explains her calm demeanor. After meeting Elisa, Nanoa leaves, and Kyuz explains that Nanoa is Sayaka's childhood friend and one of the most popular students at the school, with connections in the upper echelons. He advises Elisa to focus on Sayaka during the debate. As the debate is about to begin, Elisa stands on stage, facing an overwhelming crowd. She worries whether she'll manage, recalling how she was ignored last time. However, she decides to push forward, motivated by her commitment to Kyuz, who agreed to be her classmate. Meanwhile, the students whisper among themselves, doubting Elisa's ability to give a speech and predicting that Sayaka will crush her. Feeling immense pressure, Elisa suddenly hears Kyuz asking her an unexpected question about whether she uses a cup. Startled, her eyes widen in shock as she quickly covers herself, asking if he really thinks it's appropriate to ask such a question at that moment. Kyuz, trying to justify himself, explains that there's no better time to ask since she can't hit him in front of so many spectators. He then clarifies that his intention was to distract her and check if she's calmer now. He points out that she's not truly facing Sayaka but rather an idealized version of her past self. He advises Elisa to stop striving for perfection and instead focus on doing what feels right to her. He reassures her that if things get tough, he'll take care of everything. These words help Elisa regain her focus. As Kenzaki begins the school congress, he announces that the motion up for debate is proposed by Sayaka Taniyama, with Elisa Q and Masachika Q in opposition. The topic is the review of the faculty's access to the council. When Sayaka takes the podium, she argues that the current council system, where anyone can offer themselves for leadership, has led to unqualified individuals being in positions of power. She shares data from former council members, collected by Nanao Sayaka, indicating this has been an issue for the last three years. Sayaka suggests that the council should be exclusive to those recommended by teachers, who possess real talent, and she asks for the students' support in approving this change. Sayaka's speech receives loud applause, and many students doubt Elisa will be able to counter such a compelling argument. When it's Elisa's turn to speak, she recalls Kyuza's advice to do what she believes is right. With newfound clarity, she refutes Sayaka's motion, arguing that it could have the opposite effect of what is intended by undermining the authority of the school council. Elisa points out that the motion would strip the president and vice president of their right to appoint staff, positions that hold the highest authority and respect in the council, elected by the students through a competitive process. By diminishing these roles, the motion would weaken the council's integrity and the democratic process that grants these leaders their privileges. Elisa continues her speech, emphasizing that the core responsibility of the president and vice president is to select their council members. Granting teachers any share of that authority would imply that the school council cannot function independently of the faculty, which undermines the school's philosophy of respecting student autonomy. She questions the consequences of a council composed entirely of members chosen by the faculty, pointing out that this would strip the president and vice president of their ability to choose trustworthy peers and resist undue influence from teachers. As Elisa speaks, Kyuz observes the students, noticing that both Sayaka's and Elisa's arguments resonate with them, creating a split in opinions. He mentally notes that Elisa is standing on her own without his help, feeling proud of her. After Elisa finishes her speech, she receives a decent amount of applause from the students. Kanzaki then starts the debate, with Sayaka speaking first. Sayaka reiterates that the school board has been accepting all volunteers recently, suggesting this could lead to issues with poor performance. Elisa counters, asking for specific examples of problems caused by this approach, as she hasn't seen any. Sayaka insists that teacher review is necessary to prevent poor performance, but Elisa argues that this decision should rest solely with the president and vice president. She acknowledges that these leaders can seek help from teachers if needed, but it should not be imposed by others. As Sayaka starts to feel cornered, Kyuz realizes that Sayaka has underestimated Elisa, having focused too much on him. Sayaka tries a new tactic, asking what would happen if the president and vice president abused their power. Before Elisa can respond, other students begin to speak up, agreeing with Sayaka and questioning whether a stranger could truly understand the school's unique needs. Kyuz notices that this sudden shift in the student's opinion was likely orchestrated by Nan Noah, Sayaka's partner. Elisa, overwhelmed by the pressure and losing her train of thought, begins to blank out. Sensing her distress, Kyuz steps in, gently patting her back and reassuring her that she's done a great job. He then takes over at the podium, joking that Elisa's vocal cords aren't used to talk so much because she's usually quiet. He tells the audience that he wants to wrap things up quickly so Elisa can rest and then poses a crucial question, is this debate really necessary when the students already made their decision by electing Kenzaki as president? Kyuz reminds everyone that Kenzaki was an underperforming student who barely stood out in class, yet they trusted him enough to lead. Kenzaki, having worked hard to become a good candidate for the presidency, highlights that his success was only possible because the current system allows anyone with the desire and determination to lead the council. With nothing more to add, Kenzaki moves to the closing statements and asks Sayaka if she's satisfied with how things have turned out. Instead of responding, Sayaka runs off, and Elisa decides to follow her. Nanoa, Sayaka's ally, implies that they'll withdraw their motion, leading Kenzaki to officially close the school congress. Afterward, we get a glimpse into Sayaka's thoughts. She reflects on how she once believed that Kyuz and Yuki were the perfect pair with an unbreakable bond, making her feel envious but also accepting her defeat because of their connection. 
However, seeing cues with Elisa made her feel betrayed. Elisa catches up to Sayaka and stops her. Sayaka tearfully asks why it had to be her, explaining that she accepted her loss because she believed Kyu's and Yuki were special. Now, she feels confused and betrayed. Elisa encourages her not to keep her feelings bottled up, but Sayaka insists that she has no right to say anything. She admits that she feels foolish for putting Kyu's and Yuki on a pedestal and trusting them completely, only to feel hurt when her expectations weren't met. A few moments later, Nanoa arrives to apologize to Elisa and assures her that she'll take care of Sayaka. Before they part ways, Elisa tells Sayaka that even she doesn't fully understand why Kyu's chose her, but she's determined to prove it was the right decision. As Nanoa takes Sayaka away, she thinks Elisa is a good person, recognizing why Kyu's chose her. Nanoa advises Sayaka to apologize to Kyu's and Elisa when she's ready, and Sayaka agrees to do so. Meanwhile, Yuki watches from a booth on stage, noting that Kyu's could have ended the whole debate quickly but chose not to. Yuki believes that Kyu's lack of a killer instinct will eventually be his downfall. When Yano, another character, praises Kyu's and Elisa for doing well, Yuki dismisses her opinion, criticizing them for being overconfident and underestimating their rivals. Later, Elisa tells Kyu's about her conversation with Sayaka and asks him why he chose her over Yuki. Kyu's explains that he initially partnered with Yuki because he felt guilty and couldn't bring himself to reject her help. He felt trapped by his guilt, thinking it was the main reason he stayed by her side. Unlike others who are motivated by their dreams, Kyu's admits he was driven by guilt, which he finds pathetic. However, this time, he ran for vice president by his own choice, not out of guilt, but because he genuinely wanted to be Elisa's partner. He hopes she understands what he means, though he struggles to express it clearly. Elisa laughs and says she wishes she could understand him better, but Kyu's doesn't let this bother him. Instead, he turns the question back on her, asking why she chose to run with him. Elisa leans in close and explains her reasons to him in Russian. After a moment, Kyu's pretends he didn't understand, asking her what she just said, but Elisa just laughs and walks away, keeping her reasons a mystery. As they prepare to leave the building, Elisa brings up the earlier comment about her breast size, making Kyu's nervous. He awkwardly explains that a girl he knows mentioned it, and Elisa replies in Russian that it's kind of right, leaving Kyu's puzzled and unable to stop thinking about her words, 